All right, we're gonna get started here in just a minute. Just getting everything pulled up here. Looks like we got one person, at least one person in here. Hello and welcome. Cool. Um, so yeah, welcome to study hall, everybody. Looks like we're getting a few more people. Uh, welcome to study hall, everybody. So uh, if you're new, I. Which I'm not sure if we've got anybody new, but I, I like to kind of go over this every the beginning of all the study halls. If you're new, um, the purpose for study halls is to give you all a venue to ask questions, and um, yeah, uh, you know, just discuss uh, any 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 um, uh, beginner or any intermediate Python uh, questions that you might have, and. I can offer solutions and explanations for things. Uh, we can also take this as an opportunity to kind of cover uh, outside topics. Um, there's some co topics that I am willing to cover in kind of an impromptu way, and then some that I uh, I'm open to you suggesting any topic, um, any like you know beginner, intermediate, or maybe even an advanced Python topic. Um, and some topics I will want to like maybe prepare for and like work up a, a little presentation on and stuff. Somebody mentioned uh, I was talking about file IO a while ago, and somebody I asked for people uh, to let me know if they'd be interested in that, and um, there was some interest in that. Um, so I think uh, perhaps next Monday or Wednesday study hall, I think I'll do something on file IO. So. Just wanted to give everybody that update. Uh, I want to work up a little project and a presentation um, to talk about it because it's a it's not terribly in depth, but it's a it's a fun topic and there's a bit to it. Um, so yeah, if you if there's any questions or things uh, from the Python material and like premium prep that you know things that maybe we didn't get to cover as in depth as you'd have wanted um, in in lecture. Um, Feel free to ask about them here, and um, I'll do my best to, to chat about those. And then, let's see, of course, if you have questions from Learn, just please include a link uh, to the question. You can just send me a link and say, like, hey, would you show a solution and an explanation for this? Or you can say, I'm struggling with this. This is the code that I have, um, or something like that. But as long as you include the link, um, I'll be able to find it quickly and answer your question. Um, we got a request for the uh, Poisson distribution. I uh, Topio is going to be taking Friday sessions, um, and I think I think I'll I'll uh, pass that on to them uh, to Tovio and uh, ask that they cover um, Poisson distribution stuff on Friday, if that's all right. I think they'll be able to offer a better. Uh, more insight into that than I will. So uh, I do want to keep things local uh, for my streams, localized to Python topics. Um, cool. Um, all right. So um, again, I don't have anything specifically planned for this unless anybody's got a question and I, I don't see a uh, question. Um, right now, a Python question uh, in the uh, Slack chat, Slack thread right now. So um, do feel free to just post that in there. If you have one at any time, um, feel free to pop it in. Last time we went through some of the materials and I just thought just to mix it up, uh, I just picked some Code Wars problems. And I like to, I like to go through Code Wars problems uh, to, to sort of showcase like problem solving strategies. Um, so I, I like to pick just real simple problems where the the actual uh, code to implement a solution isn't that complicated. So I can kind of talk about the form of problem solving. Um, so we can just go over some test driven development concepts and just sort of basic procedural things that I do to just sort of facilitate easier problem solving. And uh, we'll just start with some e super easy problems, and maybe we'll do a harder problem at the end. Um, so 
you've probably heard Tovio and I mention, talk about Code Wars. If you're not familiar with it, this is it. Um, when you sign up for an account, uh, I think it'll take you to this dashboard page. I always go to, I always come over here to Kata, and this just lets you search all the different problems. Um, I recommend that you go and you select the difficulties that you want. Uh, so eights and sevens are the easiest. Ones and twos are the hardest. And the ones and twos, the ones and twos are very, very hard. Um, I had somebody explain it to me once, like the ones take like a Google senior developer a weekend to complete. They are, some of the ones are like implement um, an entire language in another language, right? Their whole, their full language specifications. So they're non-trivial <laughs> problems. Um, whereas the eights and sevens tend to kind of explore one simple concept or two, one or two kind of simple con programming ideas at a time. So um, for that reason, I, uh, I recommend people start with eights and sevens, just kind of get your feet wet with it. Um, things start getting interesting with sixes and fives. So we're just gonna keep it, uh, if I wanna select a range of difficulties, I can just uh, click and drag my mouse um, for a range of, diffi of difficulties. I'm gonna just do sevens and eights for now, right now. We'll go from there. Um, okay, cool, actually, sorry, it looks like we do have a, a request for a question. So. Uh, accumulator challenge two in dictionaries, could we solve and talk it through live if no one else has a question? Yes, awesome. Thank you for the question. Let's pop this in. We'll pick up with Code Wars later. I mean, hopefully we'll just get uh, a bunch of questions and we can just go through stuff that people wanna go through. All right, so this is on uh, dictionary accumulators. And the request is to go through this one, dictionary accumulator two. So write a function called modulo dict, blah, blah, blah. There we go. Okay, so what I always like to do, uh, just me personally, I always like to paste in my problem statement into my editor just so I have it on site, it's easy for me to access and read, uh, and I can kind of pick out useful information. I'm always on the lookout for first thing that I'm always on the lookout for, whether it's a problem in Learn or Code Wars or whatever, um, or a problem in real life, which is, you know, a lot of the coding that I do, it doesn't have a, uh, um, like a problem statement, like solve this problem, it's like, I'm looking at something and I wanna uh, figure out how to solve it myself, you know, but. Um, whether I'm writing it or I'm going through a, a problem from a website or something, I'm always on the lookout for an example. This is, this is like the first thing that I wanna generate. So I see this, uh, it says here's an example of how the function should work. Uh, and what an example is, to my mind, is a test, right? It's an assertion that uh, this, this function call with this input should yield this output. It should give me that as an output. So I'm gonna print this out. So uh, when this returns, um, it will return this dictionary if it's if it's succeeding, if it's doing its job correctly. Uh, and I think what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna say exp for expectation, and I'm gonna say uh, rest for result, and then I'm gonna say, oops, uh, I'm gonna say res equals exp. And if this says true, then I know I'm uh, my result that I'm actually producing is um, matching what I expect it to produce. Uh, res equals exp, and then I'm gonna print res. Uh, and then that way, if it fails, I can see, you know, so if I get a false here, I can see, well, why didn't it? pass. I can actually look at it and see how it differs from my expectation. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to delete that bit. Um, now I'm going to stub out my function. I say def 
like this. It's going to take in like a number, it looks like. And then I'm just going to say pass. All right. So I'd like to set all this up. And I don't even have the, um, I have a test, but I don't even have, I haven't even, excuse me, I haven't even uh, read the problem statement yet. But I still know, you know, whether, regardless of what this is asking me to do, I know I want at least one test. So I uh, encourage you to do that, to, to write at least one test. It doesn't have to have this res, res and exp thing. Oops, that's x. I wanted exp. Um, you know, it doesn't have to look exactly like my test. But as long as you're just printing off the function call like that, you can get rid of this. Um, you know, you want at least this. Um, and, you know, I would say at least uh, where you're printing off the function call and then you have a comment that just says what you're expecting that to return. So, all right, so now we're set up. Now let's read through here and see what it's actually asking us to do. So write a function called modulo dict. Good, done that. That's done. Uh, this function should do the following. Take a single number as an argument in, that seems good. Uh, this number will be used in the modulo operation. It should calculate the modulus using the argument of every number from zero included in the range to 100 not included. So uh, range zero to 100 exclusive is how we would say that. Uh, we always assume that uh, lower bound zero in this case is included and the upper bound is excluded. So if I wanna write such a range, I can just say range uh, 100. Uh, it should calculate the modulus uh, using the argument of every number from 0 to 100 exclusive. The keys will be the possible uh, modulus values. The values will be the count of times that modulus value, modulo value occurs. Excuse me. Um, okay, cool. So I wanted to return a dictionary. Oops, I don't know why I did, did that. It's kind of like thinking about two things at once. Okay, uh, I meant to do that. Okay, so this is our dictionary and um, I'm just gonna return it. Let's just say for I in range 100. Um, now I have this call here where in uh, is two, and I have all the possible modulus values of every number between zero and 100, which is just zero or one. Um, if a number is even, um, then that number over two will have a remainder of zero. And if it's odd, that number over two will have a remainder of one. That's it, right? So if it's uh, if this was three, we would have another one here uh, for two, and obviously the values would be different because we, you know, we'd be dividing those up differently. But oops, we'll do that. And maybe I'll just set this here. Uh, we could do maybe we could do one for three as well. Okay, so uh, first goal is let me see if I can just get 50 zeros and 50 ones printed off here. So let's just see if I can calculate the modulo value correctly. Um, and then once I can do that, then I can start figuring out how am I gonna put that in as the key and how am I gonna start counting um, the uh, values as they occur. Uh, so what I always like to do if you're, especially if you're new, if you're still, if you're still learning Python and you're still like getting to the point where uh, our learn material is um, uh, challenging and you know, like you're still getting to the point where you're comfortable with everything that we kind of cover and learn. Um, when you're writing a for loop, one thing that I recommend doing just right off the bat every time as an assumption, just print out your identifier. In this case, I'm calling my identifier I, which is convention. Um, not, It's not convention in all cases, but there's a convention around calling your identifier i in a lot of cases. So I'm going to print off i. Um, and then that'll give, you know, even if it, even if you don't think you need to, 
just do it and just put your eyes on it now you know and it's like registered in your mind for sure what i is i is some number between zero uh through 99 inclusive of zero and 99. okay um so let's just try to produce that zero and that one so that i think that's just i mod n let's try that um, so I got 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So I get these alternating zeros and ones, which is what I want. And just out of curiosity, maybe if I change this to 3, I think I'd get alternating 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. Yep. Uh, if I do 5, you can kind of play around with it a little bit, you know, just kind of give yourself a sense of what's going on. So I get these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 repeating so we'll go back to two i can't i can't change that because you know my expectation is calculated for uh, modulo two okay so this is producing the correct key um, number the correct key there and i i haven't counted all the zeros and ones but i can see by the pattern that there should be an even amount of them right we start with a zero one and then we end with a zero one, right? We end with a one at the end. We start with a zero at the beginning. So presumably um, there's a hundred numbers and 50 of each, right? It seems rational enough. I think I can make that assertion without going through and counting it. So uh, we, at this point we can move on. So now I want this to be my key. So why don't I do this? I'll just, I'll just keep this simple. I'll call this K for key. You know what, why don't I call it key for key, right? Um, so key equals I mod N. We'll just prove that again, key, there we go. So that's gonna be our key. Okay, uh, and then I can say, basically what I wanna do is I want the key to be the key in the dictionary. Right now the dictionary has no keys. Uh, and then I want to, for every time I encounter that key, I want to increment the value by one. I want the value to reflect one. So uh, I want to increment, so increment will be a plus equals by one. And I want to, the thing that I want to increment is described as D sub key. So D sub key plus gets one. So this will increment the value at key, but it won't put the key in the dictionary. Let me run this. You're going to see we're going to get an error. It says key error is zero. So it basically says um, zero was not found as a key. So I can't increment the integer at key zero because there is no key zero. I didn't add it in. This is just saying to increment the integer there. And there is no integer there because there's no there to have an integer at, right? So we need to make this location, D sub key, we need to make that location exist before we can modify it. So the way I like to do this is to say, uh, if key not in D dot keys, then we can do, oh, that's id. I wanna say if, if key not in D dot keys, um, we'll say D sub key equals zero. So if the key is not a key in the dictionary, we want to make it exist. And now these two lines look really similar, right? You, you might think, well, how can these be that different if they, if they look so similar, right? And obviously it's just really one character difference. But plus equals, remember, is syntactic sugar for this. D sub key equals D sub key plus one, right? So plus equals, this plus equals line gets rewritten after after we run it internally in, in the Python interpreter, it gets rewritten and, and understood as this line below it. So in order for this line to be rational, to mean anything, there has to be some value at D sub key that already exists, right? Um, I think sometimes this makes more sense if we do like a equals a plus one, 
well, this isn't going to run because there is no prior value of a, you know, and Python doesn't know, can't really infer what that value should be, right, uh, without us telling it specifically. Because what if we wanted a to equal 100 uh, initially, right? Python can't infer that for us. Now, you could say, well, maybe it should infer that we want it to start at zero, and that, that seems rational enough, but um, it's sort of one of those things like err on the side of enforcing explicit code uh, that's clear. That way, your intentions are kind of always, always clear. So Python will make you create the thing before you can modify it. Okay, so all that to say, uh, if the key is not in the dictionary keys, then we will make it exist and we'll initialize it as zero. And then whether or not it already existed or didn't already exist, after this if, it does exist, right? Uh, it, it does exist either because it already did exist or, um, or it didn't exist. Uh, but in either case, um, we have d sub k or d sub key plus gets one so we're adding one to it so that's why we started at zero because we're about to add one to it immediately so if i run this you can see my output now says true uh, because we have zero uh, as a key that occurred 50 times and one that occurred 50 times as well cool let me know if this solution is helpful if it makes sense uh, if you have any questions i'm I'm trying to just go slow and kind of explain the process and my thinking behind it. Um, but yeah, I'll give people a second with this one. Uh, let me know if you have follow-up questions or if or if that was helpful. If you're good to go. Cool. Actually, we got to answer. Um, good. I'm glad that was helpful. I'm going to just include my code there just so there's a record for it. Awesome. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, cool. Uh, you know, it does, one thing just occurred to me with this. This is, this is a really common pattern with dictionaries. Um, I hope this doesn't get overlooked because dictionary dictionary accumulators can kind of look a few different ways. I think it's like they kind of have a few forms that are common. And this is maybe the most common form. Um, keys can take a variety of different forms, but if we sort of abstract this away from this particular problem, there's this pattern that you see a lot of like if the key doesn't exist in the dictionary uh, initialize it with whatever the appropriate initial data is and then modify it and then this modification happens you know this the, it, this modification happens safely because you know the lines the two lines before it just ensured that this location that we intend to modify exists so um, this is a really common pattern, like check to see if the key is in the dictionary keys, make it exist if it doesn't exist, and then modify the value accordingly. Um, the, way I, the way I really think about this is that this is a dictionary accumulator accumulating a key value pair here, and it's an integer accumulator. It's just that the integers are um, located in the dictionary. So. So it's sort of a dual accumulator inside of a dictionary, but I don't know. That's how I think about it. It's not really that important. All right, um, let's move on. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Uh, I think I want to just give you all a minute. Um, I'm just going to refill my water real quick. And um, we'll just take a minute. See if anybody's got any other questions. Uh, don't be shy, just feel free to get them in there and uh, we'll go through them when I get back.
Okay, cool. I'm not seeing any questions posted at the moment. That's fine. Um, I'll just pick a code words problem. We'll go from there. Uh, also, sorry about the short break there. I really did have to get some water. It is so hot in my house, um, and I don't know why my room is as hot as it is, but it is always very hot in this room here. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm like, just sitting here, just sweating, and I'm like, I gotta get some water. Okay, I do feel better now. Uh, all right, so we're back in Code Wars. And, uh, you know, just to be clear, if, if anybody's got a question, just feel free to post it at any time. I'm just gonna pick a Code Wars problem and go through it to completion. But uh, if there's a question in the chat, we'll, I'll take it after that. So, um, <clears throat> we've got, uh, We've got some seven and eights here. And I don't know, so so far as like going and picking a problem, I've had a lot of people ask me like, well, I wanna work on dictionaries. How do I go do that in Code Wars? Um, or, you know, dictionaries or, you know, something specific. I think one of the useful things about Code Wars is you that you don't know what you're gonna get. So you, you just jump into a problem and you have to figure out whether it needs dictionaries or list or, strings or you know you have to kind of figure out how you want to solve that problem so um, yeah it's um it's sort of I think part of part of the utility of it for if you do have something specific that you want that you need information on I think our material is well suited for that um, the galvanized learn material in basic or premium prep. Um, and I think um, what I want, what I do when I want to look up specific features, maybe like there's certain things that like I'll use for something that I'm doing and then for a short period of time or once, and then I'll forget about them and do something else or whatever. Um, and then I'll need to look them up again, or, you know, there's certain features uh, in languages that I'm learning. And if I want to know something specific, I'll just search for it. I'll look through Stack Exchange and I'll look through uh, Reddit is a good place, depending on the language. Um, there can be some pretty good um, uh, programming communities on Reddit um, and uh, just other, just around the internet, just forums and articles and documentation, those kinds of things. But if you want actual material, I think our material is suited for like, well suited for like targeting something specific. Um, and I think Pi uh, Code Wars is tar well suited for like, pick something that sounds interesting and figure out how to solve it, right? Um, and sometimes they'll give you various hints and constraints and things, and sometimes they won't. So. Um, I'm just gonna pick one at random. I don't know, highest to lowest. That looks like it's a problem that we could solve. Um, it'll give you a little synopsis for it. You'll hit train up here. So again, um, I went through this problem in learn. I think we've got a bunch of regulars on the stream today. Oh, and it looks like somebody's saying that they have a small question. Uh, feel free to pop it in there. I'll, um, I'm gonna try to move through this fairly quickly and uh, I'll take your question after the um, after I move through this um, code wars problem. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think we've got, like I was saying, I, th I think we've got a few uh, mostly regulars, uh, I think, in the stream today. Um, probably people have heard me lecture and stream before uh, and you know how you, you probably kind of have a sense of how I work. Uh, most of you and uh, uh, how I I kind of try to put an emphasis on uh, writing at least one or two tests before you start uh, and things like that. So uh, I showed that process here and I'm basically going to do that for this problem as well. So first thing, oops, I'm going to take my problem statement, put it in a doc string. Next thing, and we can see we have examples here. 
Uh, next thing is, so this cell here on the bottom right, we have these three cells. Up here, you've got uh, your, um, your obviously your problem statement. You, you have your output window as well when you run the code. I really recommend that you don't actually do the work of pr solving the problem in the Code Wars REPL. It's just not a very good environment for working out of. Um, obviously, here's where your solution is going to be. And then here, down here in the bottom right, there's tests. So I recommend just grabbing these tests. I'm going to just copy paste them. And I'm looking for any any line of code that calls the function that I'm going to write, so which is high to low. And I'll, I'll do the same thing here. I'm just going to stub out the function. So we're going to say uh, def high, high and low. I said high to low. And this is going to take in numbers. Um, and we're going to return something. Uh, I'm just going to leave that return in there. Uh, this says return numbers there, but I don't know. I'm going to, I'll figure out what to do. Uh, I don't need some random function head from the internet telling me what to do with my code. Anyways, I'm just, just messing around. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, in the tests here, I'm looking for any line of code that calls my function, right? And most of the Code Wars tests are gonna use these assert equals. We're not gonna use these. So any line of code that doesn't call my function, in most cases, you can just get rid of it. And now I, I'm left with these assert equals, like this. And I'm just gonna turn these into prints, just like that. We don't have to do anything fancy. We don't have to use any fancy library or anything. Uh, we can just jump straight in. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do is just try to break these out. So those test assert equals, you, you could keep everything like this. And what you're going to get is your result of your function and then the expectation. But I'm actually going to break everything out into tests like I had before. I'm gonna close that off there, and then we're gonna do this. Uh, I don't know why that one's super broken. Okay. All right, let me try this again. Whoops. There we go. Close this off. And we'll do the same thing actually here. Take those down there. Drop that in there. And we're going to do the same sort of This, we're going to say exp equals this, and res equals this, and we'll pull these prints down. There we go. And we'll say res equals exp. Okay, and I think that's everything. I think that's everything. Let me make sure I got all this. Oh, I want to print out my RESs as well. Ah, okay. There we go. Okay, so I got a bunch of tests. I've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight tests. Great. Um, and then I also kind of want to see if some of these tests include these here. So I'm just going to look for these inputs. 
Um, I don't see that one. I'm doing a bulk select to see if it shows up anywhere. Don't see that one. Don't see that one. Okay, cool. So um, these are valid tests that are actually not being tested for as well. So let's do this. Um, These are our expectations. So we'll say res equals and exp equals and print res equals exp comma res. Bam. More tests. All right. I think we have enough tests. We don't, usually don't even need this many tests, but I don't know. You, you all probably know how gung-ho I am about tests, so I'm just going to own it. I know it's ridiculous, but um, I'm going for it. So, all right, so in this little assignment, you are given a string of space-separated numbers. Okay, space-separated numbers, and you have to return the highest and lowest numbers. Great. So, so we have a string, and we want to return the the um, we want to return a string as well. So uh, I'm going to call this num stir like this number string, and we're going to return. Uh, high, low, string, something like this. OK, so I know that I can turn this string into a list separated by spaces, um, or excuse me, separated on spaces with split. So I can split this string into a list. So let me just do this. I'm going to print uh, num stir dot split, just like that. OK, so there's my list of numbers. And so I have this list of numbers. And I'm going to try mapping this list of numbers and I wonder, do I have any uh, floating point numbers? I don't think I do. It says a list of numbers, but I think they're actually all going to be a list of integers. I'm looking through here to see if I see any dots. Um, while I'm here, I'm going to just do a bulk find and just see if I find any dots. Uh, dot keys, there's some periods and sentences. There's a dot split, dot keys. OK, so no dots, no floats. Um, cool, so I can cast these as ints. So what I want to do is map uh, these to the int function. I could do it this way with map. I'll show a different way here. List? All right, list. OK, so now we have a list of actual integers. And uh, with this list, I think what I, let's do something like this. Let's say, um, let's just call this list, because I, I can't think of a better name for it. Uh, and then we'll call this low. And we want it, oh, excuse me, we want it high and low. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter at all which way we do it. I'm going to call this high equals uh, max list and low equals min list. And then I guess, you know, I don't even need to do this high low string. I can just say, uh, return high, oh, I know, I'll return an F string, and I'll do, oops, high, low, 
like that. True. So I'm just looking for any falses. Looks like they're all true. Looks like that passed all my tests set ago. Uh, so since I'm only using this high variable, I'm not using this. Um, I'm actually not using. I set this up as an accumulator pattern. It's not even an accumulator pattern. And since I'm only using these in one place, what I like to do in most cases where, you know, where I'm, the code that I'm copying out is simple, I just like to use that right in line like that. Uh, and we can just do that. Same thing there. Um, <clears throat> so we can further, let's see, we could rewrite this uh, as a comprehension. And I'll do this as a for loop and as a comprehension as well. So um, I could do, I'll just save a few different versions of this. I could do list as a comprehension. Um, so I could say, uh, int, int of, I'm just going to call it nm, uh, for nm in, I'm going to call it NMC for number character. Uh, I like to, when it's a string, I like to make that clear. And for me, if I put C or CH in something like this, uh, that's my own kind of personal shorthand to remind myself that this is a character in a string. So for number character and string dot split, we're going to put an int of that number character in the list. And we'll see if this works. Looks like I've got all trues there, so that's also working. Uh, and then let's do this as a just a vanilla accumulator. We'll just do an empty list there. And I could say for uh, nmc and nums, oops, num stir dot split. Uh, list dot append int nmc and for those of you who don't know about comprehensions I, I'm gonna go over comprehensions list and dictionary comprehensions uh, at length in, on Saturday in premium prep if you're in premium prep we'll talk about it there um, So, for those of you who don't know about comprehensions, this for loop uh, accumulator structure is essentially exactly the same. And if you look, it basically has all the same parts. Um, but basically, what's happening here is this first part of the comprehension is the thing being appended to the list. And then you have your loop head. So you say, you know, for number character in. Uh, in the split string numster, uh, you're placing in the list an int of numc. So basically, that's the same, and that's the same of what that's the same thing that's happening in this for loop as well. And just we'll just prove that that works as well. I'll run the code. Cool. All right. Uh, I think this is my favorite version, so I'm going to stick with this. And I could, I, I feel like somebody's probably wondering, like, you know, why I don't do this. And I could do that, but there's a fair amount of code being duplicated. Um, and I, comprehension is a heavy enough operation. It's not a terribly heavy operation, but heavy enough that makes me think that I'd rather just do it once rather than produce two identical lists and perform that process twice. So I'll do this once, save it in a variable, and then return it. And to me, this is a nice balance between clarity, uh, you know, a clear solution, and uh, a fairly well-optimized solution. Cool. So I'll submit that. And then the cool thing is, 
No, oh, let's see. Submit. Oh no, it's loading. I guess. Can you see that? Yeah, it's just loading. So the cool thing is, after you go through and you solve your problem, and you can look at other people's solutions as well. And if we look here, oh, that's interesting. This, this person did almost exactly the same thing. Um, they did a little bit of a different style F string and um, they did, um, they named their variable something, their list something different. Uh, but this is exactly this, the, in terms of the, uh, you know, the idea of, of how to solve this, this is exactly the same. This is essentially exactly the same. So that seems to be, wow, that seems to be kind of universally the way that people did this. Uh, here's a different one. Aha, somebody did the whole thing in place in a join. That's kind of neat. So there's a few, few ways to do that. Cool. And you can go back to Kata and choose another one. So I do see somebody posted a code or a, a question and I know somebody somebody said they had a small question. Uh, uh, please go ahead and put that in. Um, I'm gonna take this other question here as well while you're putting your question in. Uh, so somebody's saying, I have a code wars problem I need help with. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Oh, um, go ahead and send me a link to that problem. What I did wrong or why it's not working. Let's see. So I have a screenshot of it. Go ahead and send me a link to it and I'll be able to, to go through it. Depending, I mean, if it's like a, a four or a five or something, I, I'm probably not gonna, we're probably not gonna have time, but um, yeah. Write a function that takes in an integer. Da -da -da. Okay. Yeah, to the person asking about the code words problem, uh, go ahead and send me in a link to that. And I'm gonna take this other question because I know this person was asking me uh, or was saying that they were gonna bring in this question on and learn today, so. So here's a question from learn and we have some code to accompany it. And, um, Let's see. Open-ended, so this is number two, open-ended challenge. Oh, I pretend like you didn't see the uh, answer there. I'm just gonna put this up here at the top so I can, we can kind of come back and look at that answer don't read it though, because you'd be cheating. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, I think this one, what is this? Complete the function called next prime, okay. So the person asking this, oops, is providing some of their own code and we have a little bit of an explanation of their code too. three versions of this, and I don't know. I'm gonna do this. Okay, so we've got three attempts at this, it looks like, and this person's question is, 
for this problem, there are two functions written. First function finds uh, if a number is prime or not. Yep. Second is delivering the next function. So yeah, so it's just going to find the, the next prime number. My questions are one in the second function, presumably the next prime function, you mean? Uh, I posted three versions of the code, all of which are correct. Okay. Uh, is there a best practice way to write this with a while loop? Personally, I don't like writing a, the Boolean flag version. I'm inclined to agree with that. Um, the Boolean flag version is can be useful if you intend to do the is prime logic in line. And I think there are there might be an optimization you can do with that, but I don't know. Um, yeah, so I kind of think there's not, but sometimes, sometimes it, sometimes. So best practice is usually if a if some part of your logic can be broken out into its own function. Usually you want to do that. Uh, in certain cases, doing running logic in line can be more efficient. So like kind of integrating some function logic into a specific problem might, you know, rather than having a, you know, going out to a different function, you know, writing that logic in line may be advantageous in certain scenarios. Um, and sometimes where you would have a function that would return a Boolean, if you do the logic in line, you, you kind of have to use a Boolean flag. And in that scenario, I think a Boolean flag makes sense. Um, but I don't, I, I kind of avoid Boolean flag solutions wherever possible. I don't, they feel kind of clunky to me. Um, and then we have a, some more on this. So also in version one of the code, it incorporates a function as the while loop condition. Oh, not is prime, yes. I see. I see what's happening here. Um, that's usually how I write that, by the way. So in that version, it incorporates a function as, the while, as part of the while loop condition, is that okay? Essentially my question might be of the uh, third version, which is the recommended way, well, okay. So it sounds like basically like you just want my opinion on each of these uh, different versions. Um, Basically, that sounds like what you're asking for. Is there a best practices way? Um, so yeah, I can just go through these and kind of throw in my two cents on how to do this. So as far as a best practice. This looks the most like what I prefer to do. Um, I'll show you what I prefer to do, and it's very similar. What I actually usually like to do is just use the num directly as a counter. You have to do this, though. You have to do num plus 1. You have to check num plus one and return num plus one. It, it is it is logically identical to what you have here. Um, it, there's no it's there's no reason to do. I don't know. There's there's not like a like logically distinct reason to do it the way I do it over the way that you're doing it here. It's just the differences are stylistic. They're not actually. You know, um, it, it's not changing any anything about the way this works. So these two work exactly the same. Um, 
So to the question, is it okay to have a function call in a condition in a while loop? Yes, it is okay. This is, this is, yeah. Uh, I think this would be considered by most people to be best practice. I think this would be sort of canonically best practice. Um, an alternate way that I'll do this sometimes is Oops. Okay, I just lost my code there. Okay. If uh, num is prime, so this is an alternate way. Sometimes I'll write it like this. Sometimes I'll write it like this. Um, this does work. I don't know, just slightly differently. I, I'm just doing a while true, which is just like loop forever. I, I write a w lot of while loops as while trues, honestly. Um, I think people would look at this and say, oh, that's a bad practice. And I don't think it's specified anywhere in PEP8 or in the Python docs not to do this. I don't think it ever says anywhere not to do this. Um, I think people are scared of this because they're, they're like, you're writing an infinite loop. And to me, all while loops are infinite loops. That, that's how I think about them. I think about them as like, it's a loop that goes forever until you tell it to stop, right? So to me, writing a while true sort of reminds me of the burden that I have to, to be responsible for stopping this loop. And I kind of like stopping loops with ifs uh, and breaks or returns inside of them. That just, maybe you could call it a stylistic choice, but I, I kind of like thinking about while loops that way. Um, so e both of these solutions to me are, are equally preferable. Um, yeah. And I think that the, it, this is what you have, this is essentially what your second solution is here. Um, it looks like you had, okay, so I deleted your counter. I wasn't sure. Presumably you had it like like this um, and then had this down here. So one thing that I would say if you were gonna write, so this is basically like my second solution. This is essentially the same thing, but one thing to make make while loops easier when you <clears throat> when you have code when you're when you're writing a while loop, whether you're doing a while true or a while you know with a formal condition in it, there's usually something that um, acts as what I'm gonna call a controller. And in this case, that's counter in the, in the code that you provided. So a controller is something whose state changes and as a result of that state change, uh, eventually leads to the stopping condition. Uh, in most cases, or in many, many case, cases, we're incrementing something up until a threshold. Uh, in this case, we're incrementing something up until that thing is prime. We're still incrementing, but the threshold is not defined. The threshold is whether or not that number is prime yet. So what I like to do in order to keep things organized and consistent so that I, in my code, you know, in code that I write, I, I know I can look back on it and uh, have make some reasonable expectations about how I laid things out. You can't always do this, and sometimes you can do this, but it doesn't make as much sense. But in most cases, you can get away with doing this, which is to increment or to alter your controller variable as the very first action in the while loop. And if you do it this way, you're gonna need to do uh, num or counter equals num like this. Or what I what I did is just like reappropriated num for this purpose. So um, <coughs> you could make another variable if you're more comfortable with that. You could use the input. I don't really have an opinion on whether you should use the input or your own variable. If you wanna use counter, that's fine. Um, 
but if you increment the counter first, then in this case, you would have to start counter equal to num, not equal to num plus one. So that's something that I like to do. And I don't know if that is canonically considered a best practice, but it's something that I see pretty frequently in code that my peers write, um, that other programmers write, where I see the controller generally incremented at or near the beginning of the loop where possible. So I, I think about it as a tendency. You don't want to do it as a hard and fast rule because I think there are times when it doesn't make sense to do it first thing. But um, again, it's just like, if you can get away with it, why not? So that's my two cents. Um, but this is also a good, I would say this is also a good practice. That's my personal opinion though. I'm not sure if everybody would agree with me. I think while true loops are, might be a little controversial. So uh, I don't think they're bad. Like I said, like I use them all the time because it reminds me that, yeah, like I, I better be the one to, to make it stop. Otherwise it's gonna go forever. So I don't think while trues are bad, but you know, like if you wanna play it safe, the um, standard condition is probably the thing, the thing to do if you can get away with it. Um, and then this third version, just where we have a Boolean flag. <laughs> yeah. So this this Boolean flag version is actually, um, we could get rid of the flag and then just make this a true. And then this turns in, I, this is an identical solution to uh, solution two. Um, the flag isn't actually doing doing anything here since if w what we what we're doing is if the number is prime we turn the flag to true and then just return the return breaks the loop before the flag does so um, yeah if I wanted to do this with a boolean flag I don't even know what would I do I think I would just do this and then return outside the loop but you're just like you're making a flag to control your loop, then you're checking your exit condition, not to exit, but to swap the flag to stop the loop, which leads to the return. And it's kind of like, why not just get rid of the flag and just return in the thing? You know, since we got rid of the flag, we're gonna have to do a while true. And of course we gotta do counter. And then I just turned it into solution two, so. Um, I think there is a Boolean flag, uh, like a different Boolean flag solution. Maybe not. A lot of times, like, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of times it's like, do this as a Boolean flag. Um, you'll, you'll see material like this, some of our materials like this. And it's something that like, just like the solution using a Boolean flag is just like, okay, well, there's a Boolean flag present now and it doesn't really do anything useful, so. But anyways, let me let me look at this. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, this is this is pretty good. That's a good question though. Um, it's interesting. It's nice looking at like different versions of something and like, you know, seeing which is preferable. But, you know, so I guess to give you a more a shorter and more concise answer, uh, I like the solution two style that you gave. Um, personally, I think it's fine. Uh, I don't think it's any better or worse than the solution one style. I think solution one style is probably what's gonna be regarded most universally as best practices. Um, solution three is, like you said, you don't like it. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree with that sentiment, so cool. Uh, we got a follow up to this. And I know somebody said that they had a Code Wars uh, problem with Code, uh, code Wars problem. Uh, feel free to send me a link to that code words problem and I'll be happy to take it and go through it.
one second here. If anybody's got a question, uh, feel free to pop it in. We got a, one more uh, follow-up to the isPrime question here. Uh, the last question for isPrime function in the for loop, if I change for i in range to to int to square root of n, yep, to for i in range two to n plus one, it doesn't work. Yes, that's correct. It won't work if you do that. So there's a um, even though it isn't size way, shouldn't it at least still be correct? Uh, this is an interesting question, and um, I'll do my best to clarify it to those on stream. If you're not if you're not reading the question, so the question is regarding the is prime function. Um, I'm gonna. Okay. The question is regarding this line, um, the upper bound of the range. And they're asking um, if they change uh, this to, to this, it doesn't work. And, and they're saying, uh, shouldn't this at least work? So there's a few ways to construct this range. Um, if you do n plus 1, you're going to include n, and then you're going to get through for every, for every value, or excuse me, for every number, you're going to check all the way up to and including n. And every number is always evenly divisible by itself. Um, n over n is always one. And that's, a, so n is a divisor of itself. So if I check, if I run this range uh, from two to n plus one, so that's n inclusive, and I've got like uh, 29, which I know is a prime number. So 29 is a prime number. Um, if I've got, n plus one, that's gonna include 29. Well, I'm gonna get all the way up through 28 and not find any divisors. Then i is gonna be equal to 29. This will say 29, uh, 29 equals zero, which is true. So the, the, the largest set that you can do that's possible is this. You wanna do uh, range two to n exclusive. You wanna exclude n. Because if you include it, then you'll never get a, um, every number you check will return false, uh, even if it's a prime number. Um, so range two to n. And then let's see. Yeah, so what this is gonna do, obviously we don't wanna start at zero. If we started at zero, then i would be zero. We'd be dividing by zero, so that's a problem. We don't wanna start at one because everything is divisible by one. n over one is n, n over n is one. That's that sort of same relationship in reverse. Um, so we'll start at two, we'll start at n over two. Um, and then we'll go up to and, and, and excluding up to but not including n. Um, that's one way to do it. Now you're doing extra work here. So like the person was saying, uh, this is gonna be more optimized, but yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
Cool. I don't think we're going to get a link to that Code Wars problem. I wonder if the person who was asking has uh, hopped off the stream. Oh, that's OK. If anybody has any follow up questions to this, um, feel free to pop them in there. I like the prime functions. They're, I don't know. I find them fun. Um, but yeah. Oh, I see. I guess while I'm here, I'll uh, put in usually the way I I would write this. Um, always check if n is less than. Uh, we'll just do less than two. We'll return false. Um, this if n equals two thing is useful if you want to start your range at three and then uh, go in steps of two. Um, and then actually this will be uh, if n mod two. And that'll catch two. Oops. Nope, I'm wrong. I have to do that. I have to do this as well. that. Okay, so if n is less than 2, we'll return false. If n is equal to 2, we'll return true. Uh, if n mod 2 uh, equals 0, we'll return false. And then we'll check every odd number between 3 and n in steps of 2. Of course, we can optimize this by doing uh, int, oops, 